Bora Brewington Snaggletooth at 13th right here in Salem. And what you need to do is pull up to the computer or your phone and tune in and listen to the Horror Squad Podcast. They have so many stars and celebrities on there. Wicked, wonderful interviews. They will keep you informed of what's happening now with all of Hollywood and beyond. <laughs> Hello, welcome back to the Horror Squad podcast, episode number 352. Tonight we're talking about 1993's Hocus Pocus. I'm one of your co-hosts, Todd. We have Steve. We are joeless tonight. Uh, we just got over our Hocus Pocus. It's just it's just a bunch of Halloween event, and he's a little bit under the weather. No, I'm just kidding. He's got work, and he's busy, and it just uh, we weren't actually going to make an episode for this. We actually recorded one live at uh, day two of the, um, of the event, but audio kind of uh betrayed us so we're redoing this a little bit steve i know we've met a ton of good people awesome people throughout the whole weekend but we also got a couple interviews for them who we got oh do we have some interviews for you and yeah sorry about the uh we we promised a live episode it sounded like shit if i'm being honest and i told the guys i'm like i can't in good conscience release this it was just too messy but somehow the interviews mostly uh, made it out pretty good except for two of them um which Full disclosure, I had to re-record my questions because that mic was causing trouble, whereas the mic for the guests was actually pretty good, so I could save that part, thankfully. But you'll notice a difference in you know uh, the sound, when, especially when I talk, because that means that I had to re-record those questions. But It's like in a did... movie where it's clear, clear the ADR. <laughs> right, yeah, like, yes, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, but I really want to save these interviews because they are awesome, and... There are six of them, which is why this episode is going to be so short, because there's a lot of great stuff in there, and I really urge you to check it out at the end of the episode. Uh, the first one we have is Amber Veidt. She is the creator of the Hocus Pocus Lego set. Um, this is her second year joining the event. She helped out a lot uh, throughout uh, you know both years and the whole weekend. In fact, last year, uh, she was actually at our table, at the Horror Squad table, in the tent, uh, just kind of helping out. She gave out a lot of like stickers and magnets and stuff for us. So she's fantastic. So you want to listen to that one. Then we have Shannon Carlin. She's the author of the Witches Run Amok Hocus Pocus, the oral history book. So it's like a comprehensive look at everything that you ever want to know about how they made Hocus Pocus, how it came to be, what it almost was, and all that stuff. Uh, really, really cool person. I bought a book actually myself, got it signed from her while we were at the uh, at, at the party. And then we have Michael Haggerty. So he's the owner of a shop called Lohan's Playhouse, which makes like horror masks and props and stuff like that. So he actually had a like a, a booth at our signing event because we had, I don't know, 10 to 15 vendors at the signing event. And he was legitimately on the like complete opposite side of where our table was. And even though he was that far away from us we could like spot his masks and we had to go to like check out what he had i think one of i don't know if it was you or joe uh bought a joe jason, bought a jason mask yeah uh, yeah i bought a jason mask off him great guy he explains kind of his process and all that stuff so got an interview with him then we got zach fable he's the lead singer of the band fable cry who performed at the party on friday for the event a very good band it's a spooky band uh, out of tennessee a uh, very cool guy, so definitely uh, check that one out. Then we have a buddy of ours, Alex Di Vincenzo, who is the creator of Broke Horror Fan. So he's probably saved some of you some money over the years. You know, great brand there. He's also a contributor to a lot of well-known like horror groups like Blade Disgusting, Fangoria, and Screenbox, to name a few. Uh, he was with us all weekend. We had a blast hanging out with him. Uh, he's been there since last year as well he was also like kind of with us there and the year before actually he's been there all three years that we've done the hocus pocus thing really great guys and it really interesting stuff he had to talk about and fi finally last but not least bora brewington staggletooth the 13th that is salem's resident witch america's got talent alumni and owner of salem's black hat society bora if you've been to salem you know bora bora is <laughs> Always there. Uh, so Bora's a busker. 
in Salem. Just a fantastic interview. Great person. And uh, yeah, that's definitely one you want to stick around for because uh, she gives you all sorts of insights. Like, you know, how many uh, children does it take to boil to uh, to make a, a, a good soup and feed people and stuff? It's, it's, it's quite an interesting interview What that branches she did. make the best uh, fucking, what do they call them? The witch's ride? Uh, yeah, Broomsticks? yeah, uh, broomsticks or and whatever. everything. Yeah, Bora is. Did you, is, is, did you know she's 333 years young? I did not know. She Doesn't does look like not a look, day over no. 332. I know, crazy. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, she, she, is, she is a fucking character. Like, if you've never met her, oh my God, you're in for a treat. Because she's, she's, she's like one of the best ad loop I've ever seen. Like, she had to have taken some like improv class or something. Because... Man, she's flying off the insults to everybody. Someone walks by, says hello. She has a quip. It was just a fun time all around. Yeah, and Bora was part of our uh, like festivities all week. Uh, she hosted the the party that we had on Friday, and uh, she was also there at the autograph signing for a little bit. Her she, her black uh, black hat society had uh, a table there as well as a vendor. So a lot of great interviews. Definitely stick around for those. I'm excited for you to all hear them. Yeah, so that's uh, so I think we'll talk more about the event next week. Because I really want Joe in on that conversation because it was an incredible weekend. So next week, we're going to break it down by event, what happened, what we did, and all that stuff. So definitely check out our episode next week for all of that. But Todd, we got some pretty big news this morning regarding our movie campaign. Can you let us know uh, what's going on? Absolutely. Yeah. So the final episode, you can go over to Indiegogo.com, look up the final episode. It's also on IMDb, soon to be on Letterboxd. And we, we're not at $3,999. No, we're at $4,001, 100% funded. Freaking cool. Awesome. Like, I, I don't even know what to say. Like, Steve and I were talking off, off air and, and Joe as well. And it's like, if, if, Honestly, the, the history of the movie was originally, it was a joke that me, Steve, and Joe had where we wanted to just have a shitty ass movie on Tubi. Because if you've seen a, a shitty movie, there, there are shitty movies on Tubi that are the worst possible thing you've ever seen with like zero effort and somehow they get on Tubi, right? And we're like, we can do this. That'd be, that'd be fun as hell. And then, you know, we started talking about it and making serious um, notes and things. And it evolved from let's make a joke to let's make a serious project. And now we're at, you know, you know, 4,000 of your, of your guys hard earned money that you donated to us, thankfully. And we're like, Oh man, this is, this is for real. Like, and I'm, I'm feeling the pressure to make the movie better. Like I, I scrapped a bunch of stuff in the script and uh, I rewrote some things and I'm just making things bigger and better. Cause with this money, I'm um, not only, you know, we, you know, getting some equipment upgrades and, you know, things like that, but like, uh, good practical effects are pretty expensive, you know? And, uh, we don't want to do any bullshit CG, which you can actually, Like with good editing software, you can get some pretty decent CGI in there. But we always say on this podcast, when there's an indie movie, it's inexcusable to have CGI, right? It's it's just stupid. So, you know, we're going all practical um, and yeah, it costs money and I'm just pricing things out. I'm super excited. I'm, I'm rewriting some of the gags, like where, for example, I'm going from uh, not only does one of my characters get his head blown off with a handgun, he gets shot three or four more times when he's on the ground and just blood splatters everywhere. So stuff like that and you know i speak for joe and i know steve will, will say this shortly like super thankful keep it coming if you can you know like every little dollar counts and if you can't um donate your money totally understandable but if you can spread the word that goes a long way too so indiegogo the final episode and we shot a little bit at the convention which was fun and uh we're going to steve and i are going to shoot ours hopefully finish our segments in november and then Salem's in April when the weather is a little bit um, agreeable to what we need. So, Steve, you got any thoughts? Yeah, I, I just like really taken aback by the response that we got from our listeners and other people. Actually, even at the event when we were at the uh, autograph and meet and greet and stuff like that, uh, we had a table. People were coming by our table and stuff like that. And some people like donated on the spot and including a producer. So shout out uh, to him and everyone who shout to Ryan. Yeah, Ryan, Producer, producer and, Ryan. yeah, and, and like full of like super awesome facts that we had no idea about. Uh, uh, he's putting us on a mission to find out who plays the dad in Halloween, the original Halloween, who takes uh, Will Sandon's mask off at the beginning, uh, Michael Myers, uh, you know, when he's a kid and stuff like that. Apparently, he's missed um, 
miscredited in the movie. Yeah, yeah. Miscredited in IMDb, and he's confirmed this already with the actual actor. So yeah, uh, yeah. So fantastic people, and uh, you know, like like Todd said, we're gonna make the best movie that we possibly can. And because we're at a hundred percent, doesn't mean that we're ending our campaign. Uh, if you throw us more money, we're just gonna make the movie even better. You know, four thousand what we felt we needed to get something out. If we get more, we'll be able to maybe add more practical effects. Uh, you know, add more stuff. So yeah, you know, anything helps a lot, and I can't wait to show everyone what we got planned for this movie. Yeah, absolutely. And I do have a, a request to the audience. If you know anybody that dabbles in uh, making music or something like that that we can use for soundtrack, that's something that we're kind of uh, struggling with finding. Uh, we're looking at professional artists online. Obviously, it's a paid gig. You just got to contact us and we'll sort it out. But anyone that does score, whether it's a synth or anything like that, let us know and we'll uh, we'll see if we can make it work. But yeah, um, we, we, we are like making a huge attempt to make sure that everything we do in the movie is supporting an indie artist in some way, you know, whether it comes to our poster or special effects or, you know, all that stuff, uh, like music, like Todd said, we really don't want to go into kind of the public domain uh, route or uh, AI, you know, like we could have easily Ugh. made an AI poster and just like called it a day, but we really like you guys are supporting our indie campaign and by supporting our indie campaign, you're also supporting other people's indie stuff, you know, making masks, like custom masks, stuff like that. So that's how he kind of, you know, paid forward to other creators. And yeah, so we, we really appreciate that's, that's it. That's a great point. Yeah. yeah. The, the, the AI posters are pretty interesting and there's some fun ones, but it's just not real, man. You know? And uh, our artist that did the poster, she hand painted that, which is insane because it's so cool. But uh, yeah, I mean, we're talking about Hocus Pocus tonight. We have a shorter episode, no trivia, no news. We're just doing what watched and uh, the Hocus Pocus movie. So, Mr. Steve, what have you been watching? All right. So uh, my first one is a 2024 film, which I watched over on American Tubi. And I specify that because this movie was an unavailable in Canada and when I went to Florida, I decided to make the time to seek this movie out because it was something that I was very curious about. Even though Todd did not like it, that, you know, when someone says they don't like something, does not keep me away from it usually. It makes me like it even more. <laughs> Sometimes, yeah. So in this case, it is uh, Festival of the Living Dead. So Festival of the Living Dead, for those who don't know, is a sequel to the original Night of the Living Dead. So you're probably wondering... How's that possible? Well, they just decided it was. And what basically happened is they contained the uh, zombie epidemic in the 1960s, as you kind of see at the end of that movie. And the, the movie takes place, you know, all the way back in 2024. And we are now following Ben's granddaughter, who has his shotgun from the movie. How did she get it? We'll never know, because it is pretty much impossible that she would have gotten that shotgun but she has it, and that's basically all the connection. Can I we think. break it down why it's impossible that yeah, she has a shotgun? Absolutely. So what happens at the end of Night Limited, Dead, Steve? He gets okay. killed by the uh, <laughs> by the right. hunters that are So do you think the hunters went into the farmhouse, yep. got a shotgun, and be like, right. Oh, this must belong to this guy we just accidentally killed. Let's make <laughs> sure his family No, they didn't. Makes zero fucking sense already. No, they they think he's a zombie. Like <laughs> you know, that's yeah, it, it makes absolutely no sense. But anyway, it is what it is. That is the connection to the movie. So in this one, uh, you know, they're they're still talking about the zombie apocalypse, but it ha it's been years since they had zombies and stuff like that. So this group decide that they want to go to a festival, like a music festival, and they go to the festival, and sure enough, the zombie apocalypse happens again, and it's basically them trying to survive. It's not a big, deep plot. Um, that's really the the gist of it. And I gotta say, as a zombie film, it's decent enough. But as a sequel to a beloved classic like Night of the Living Dead, it's an awful, awful marketing ploy that does so little to honor the film it pretended to be a sequel to. Um, like, it has good zombies. It's got a good amount of gore. Uh, I like the festival setting. Like, I like uh, when I see things where there's big crowds of people. I love when they do uh, amusement parks and stuff like that. So I dig all that, but man, the characters are insufferable in this movie. The story is like bad. The dialogue is cringy as hell. And they make no effort to 
like give themselves the right to call this a, uh, a sequel to Night of Living Dead. Like the zombies don't act the same. That you know they should at least make them slow, like a Romero zombie. You know they're all quick and stuff. I don't know the the movie just left a bad taste in my mouth. As uh, just watching it, it's not horrible, but just having knowing that it's a sequel to Night of Living Dead just oh, pisses me off. So I gave it one and a half stars. Like I said, if you want to just watch it for what it is, it's not too bad. But good lord, I, movies should not be allowed to do this. So that Festival of Living Dead over on American Tubi only. Yeah, that movie's garbage. I'm glad you didn't like it because it's, it's fucking sucks. Um, yeah, over on the plane ride over to Salem, I watched Terrifier Part 1 because it's been since release date since I watched it. You know, long story short, uh, Art the Clown, it's Halloween night, a couple of girls are out in the town, they get stranded because their car is vandalized by Art the Clown, and then they go into an abandoned um, property that's getting worked on, you know, fumigation services and things like that. And one of the girls calls her sister to come pick him up at, you know, 3 a.m., Meanwhile, Art has gone on a rampage and the police are looking for him and he goes into the building and stalks our girls. So really like All Halls Eve uh, with Art, awesome. Obviously, this is different with the clown, but uh, Terrifier, I think, really exceeds when he is just being creepy, right? He's he's standing there, he's sitting there, he's staring off, he's smiling, he's doing his little creepy little waves, things like that. I think that's where he excels as a character. I don't necessarily love all the gore, Don't get me wrong, I think it's really cool, but like I said, I think it's really effective when he's just being like fucking weird because he's David Howard Thornton's uh excellent actor. His physical capabilities are excellent, his timing's really good. Yeah, and let's leave it at that. I liked it better the second time around because I felt it was kind of cheating when he pulled out a gun in the first one or when I first saw it, but this time, like, you know, I expected it and I thought it was pretty funny. I still don't think it's a perfect film. The pacing's a little weird, but overall, I think Terrifier is pretty cool. It's a three and a half out of five for me. And I believe you can watch that on, I watched it on Blu-ray, but no, I watched it on Prime. Yep, on the plane. So Amazon Prime. Nice. And we are reviewing Terrifier 3 next week, just FYI. So I uh, can't wait to discuss that one because there is a lot to discuss in that in that one. Uh, so my final one is a movie from 2010, which I also watched on Tubi. And that is Birdemic Shock and Terror, which is... So Birdemic is one of those infamously bad, like, bad films. Uh, I guess good, bad for some people. Uh, the story is there's this couple, well, this this guy and this girl, they meet each other, they fall in love. You find out about the guy's like, uh, like work stuff, like how he gets promoted and he gets the big sale, and then you see the girl and she has her own things going on as well. And then 50 minutes later, five zero minutes later, birds start attacking for absolutely no reason, and then it gets actually. in my opinion, pretty good. The birds look absolutely awful. It is all CGI birds. They're just, it's just like a flapping bird that's just like superimposed on the screen, but it's so bad that it's actually pretty funny. And there are some entertaining kills and stuff like that. Uh, this movie, you know, everyone knows who listens to the, ep to the show anyway, that I love bad movies, but there's a point where It's just so bad that I even I can't get too much enjoyment out of it. And people really seem to love this one. And I get why, because when the birds are on screen, it's really funny. It's it's just stupid. You know, there are so many movie mistakes, like Todd Gripes, that would happen in this movie. For example, the way they shoot guns. You know, they shoot guns like a friggin' three year old at a fair. You know, they 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 like cock the the barrel back and they they their whole hand goes up uh, with the recoil and it just looks bad. They have in, you know, seemingly infinity bullets and stuff like that and all that's fine because it is such a dumb movie, but it's inexcusable that there's 50 minutes of them doing absolutely nothing that pertains to the plot of the story. It's just you're basically asleep before the good stuff comes into play and that's. Uh, I, I think that's not a good thing. You need to just, if you're going to lean into something stupid like this, you need to really like attack him early on to get people interested. So I give Birdemic Shock and Terror one out of five stars. Uh, it just took way too long to get to the point. And yes, it is entertaining once it gets there, but it's not worth the wait to get there.
And I listened to like the first three minutes of that movie to see what the audio was that you said to check out, and that audio is terrible. So, oh my god, yeah. So, gosh. so something that we're like very cognizant of on our movie is they they do like multiple angles for scenes and stuff like that, but every angle sounds differently. Like you'll get one angle and you'll you'll hear like wind in the back, and then you'll hear another angle, and it's going to be echoey because of the room they're in. It's just. Oh my god, it's 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 tough. It's tough to listen to. It's tough to watch. Yeah, Um, audio is the hardest thing, man, in a movie. absolutely, it is. Yeah. It sucks. But all right, so I did rewatch uh, Late Night with the Devil. Love it. Still give it a four and a half out of five. But I'm going to talk about Lisa Frankenstein, which is currently streaming on Prime that I know you and uh, Joe both liked. And I liked it too. Um, I'll start off with my rating first. It's a three and a half out of five. But I don't think I'm necessarily the target audience for this. I can see the younger crowd, the high school kids, especially the girls, loving this movie, like being the fucking next best thing since um, uh, The Craft, you know, with yeah, powerful women characters doing their thing. I thought the story was really cool. Um, Catherine Newton is a treat, right? She plays this uh, young girl in high school, um, has a tragic past where her mom was murdered, and they kind of like treat her as an outcast, like she should get over it, and like that's her mom, you know? And she has this obsession where she goes to an abandoned cemetery where this like uh, young man has like a, um, what do you call it? A statue of his face. And he, she like, you know, sits there in the cemetery, reads to him and things like that. And one night during a storm, she wishes she was with him. Lightning strikes, yada, yada, yada. We have a new Frankenstein's monster coming in, right? So uh, we follow her as she hides him and figures out that if she steals a part, for example, a hand, sews it on him and electrocutes him that hand will like grow better and then his whole body will improve and so on and so on. So I really liked it. I like the actors. I love the lighting. I love the setting, but I don't re I couldn't really get into it completely. And I thought the pacing was a little bit off, but still, I think this is a great love story. Something that the younger crowd plus especially young ladies will fucking love. And Catherine Newton, I think this will be my best female performance of the year. Cause she's excellent in this movie. So three and a half out of five over on prime Lisa Frankenstein. Yeah, Catherine Newton is like quickly becoming one of my favorite actresses uh, going in horror right now. You know, like she, I'm, I'm putting her up there with Anya Taylor Joy and uh, you know s s some of the other. She's really uh, good. I, yeah, she's she's great. Like in this, she's just and like we've seen her in different roles at this point. You know, and that she just has a lot of range. And man, Zelda Williams, who uh, wrote, uh, who just directed this movie, her aesthetic is so good for a first time director. Love it's it. it, it's kind of crazy, like first time director, and uh, yeah, I, I was impressed with that. All right, that brings us to our main event. We got Hocus Pocus from 1993, directed by Mr. Kenny Ortega. This one stars Bette Midler, Sarah Jessica Parker, Kathy and Jimmy, Omri Katz, Thor Birch, Vanessa Shaw, Tobias Jelinek, Larry Bagby, and everyone's favorite cat, Jason Marston, and among others. Yeah, so we had all the casts this weekend. Super fun. We watched it live with them. We were able to contribute to the live commentary on stage in front of, you know, 400 people, which is fucking insane. Uh, this one is a story about Max Dennison and his sister and his family. They moved to Salem from California right around Halloween time. They're new kids on the block. They're, you know, Max especially. He fucking misses home. He misses his buddies, his friends, his school, all that shit. He immediately gets picked on by a couple of uh, bullies that everyone loves. Everyone's going to love ice. Ernie, aka Ernie, and things like that. And turns out that, you know, obviously Salem has a past history with witches, and Max doesn't believe in it, but of course, all the town people do. And it turns out, and we, we know this from a, a, a flashback scene in the beginning where three witches were killed on, and then they set a curse on the town where if someone, a virgin, lights the black candle, that they will come back to haunt the town, which is exactly what happened when Max goes to the old. Um, the old uh, witch's house, which is now the museum, lights a candle, and then the witches come back, and he goes on an adventure to kill them. I love this movie, man. I mean, it's a it's a warm hug. It's a glass of uh, you know hot chocolate on a cold night. It's perfect Halloween movie. It's got some um, some little scares in there for the kitties. It's got Sarah Jessica Parker, who's a fucking babe. Vanessa Shaw, who's a babe. Thor Birch, which is adorable. Amri Cass, adorable, and so on and so on. Everyone loves Binks the Cat. Everyone has the same feeling when he gets run over by a bus. I love the bus driver. I love when they go to the the, the dude that's dressed up as Satan and they think he's a real devil. It's just it's just fun, man. It's all around fun. 
you can nitpick it, sure. But overall, man, I just have a great time every time I watch this film. It's been like, what, every year for like three years we watch this now. And uh, yeah, I love it. Steve? Yeah, I was just going to say, like, we <laughs> we kind of have to watch it now every year uh, because of the, the event. But yeah, I, I feel the same way. I mean, so I guess what's interesting with my perspective is I didn't grow up with this film. Uh, I wasn't, you know, it's it's one I'd seen. I didn't particularly like when I was a kid, so it, it wasn't in my rotation. It's not until maybe like, I don't know, seven, eight years ago that I decided to rewatch it and start liking it. And it's one of those movies that, you know, I like more and more every time I watch it. And this past time, even though we had both the best and the worst seat in the house, uh, best in the sense that we were sitting on stage with five of the actors of the film, worst as if, uh, well, especially Todd, he's like actually glued to the screen. It's like the absolute worst. I was seat touching in the, the theater. screen. I could see like a foot. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, but yeah, this movie is just, it's just easy to watch. You know, there's a lot to love about it. Todd said a lot of the, you know, kind of key points in the movie that make it so much fun. And it keeps moving. You know, there's a lot of things that uh, keep the pace going and keep the story going. You know, you have you have your time with the kids and you get the bullies that kind of come in and you have a Halloween party with the adults. And there's an amazing musical number, which I still think is fantastic. And they absolutely should not have tried to replicate it in the sequel. Uh, then you have those characters like the bus driver and the, you know, the devil, which kind of bring this kind of humor to the story, but it's also kind of sadistic when you really look at what the Sanderson sisters are trying to do. In fact, uh, you know, in the opening scene, you see the Sanderson sisters get hung, which is crazy for a Disney movie to start a movie like that. Uh, and there's you know, the characters are so lovable. I mean, Binks to Cat, like you said, great character. The kids are great. My personal favorite is Billy Butchson. Like he's so, Doug Jones is so good in that role. Uh, and he does most of it without speaking. He does end up speaking a little bit near the end. But the movie's a delight. And it's at least, you know, it's a good movie like this that we get to watch every year. And it's definitely on my Halloween rotation forever at this point. Yeah, agreed, man. And he touched on it. It's a dark movie at its core. Like, it's really fucking dark. And I know the the original script, which the, the cast touched upon, too, was even worse. Um, but they toned it down, right? But, um, yeah, at its core, it's it's literally uh, old witches sacrificing children and essentially eating their essence and their souls. So it's like, damn, this fucking... And I the scene, too, where they put him in the school's um, giant oven thing for, like, ceramics and they kill him. I'm like, damn, that's dark, too. And they're just dancing on their graves, essentially. But yeah, and then there's also stuff for the parents, too. Like, obviously, there's some sexual tension there with Sarah Jessica Parker showing her, her cleavage off the entire movie. And then, you know, Max and um, uh, Vanessa Shaw's character, like, they're, you're like, are, are they going to date? Are they not? Things like that. But everyone's charming this movie, man. There's no one that I don't like. And that's usually, a, that's a rare thing with with a kid-focused film. It's like, you're like, that, that fucking actor sucks. But no, all the actors in this are excellent. And I don't know. It's it's just it stood the test of time, and yeah, you can't. You mentioned not replicating the the dance number, which I still think is the weakest part of this film, but it's still an excellent film. And then you have Hocus Pocus two, where they just like, oh, we have to do a dance number because people want it, but it doesn't make any fucking sense. In this movie, it makes sense because she's literally casting a spell to get all the adults out of the picture so that they can have their their way with the kids. So it's just I don't know, man. It's it's just a good ride and it it's it never feels like it's long and it always moves from plot piece to plot piece and man i can't stress enough how much i love the bus driver he, he's he's the best character in this movie yeah uh so on on our discord which is 100 percent free if you want to join and just chat with some amazing people uh every monday to thursday i ask a question about the movie we're reviewing that week and the question that i had i don't know, I think it was yesterday was basically which actor that you haven't met yet that you'd like to uh, to meet. And I mean, I've now met most of the cast, but not him. And he would be the one because I think he's hilarious. Uh, it's a very short scene, but it's funny as hell. It actually reminds me of the same scene in um, Mrs. Doubtfire when the bus driver kind of like hits on uh, Robin Williams and Mrs. Doubtfire. And it's just, you know, it just brings a little bit of humor to the scene and just cuts the pace a little bit. You know, you're... It's not the whole movie where the Sandersons are chasing the kids. There's just these like 
they take like these pauses, you know, like when they go to the house with the devil and when they go to the party. And uh, I, I love that about this film. It, it's just that that's what I like about it. You know, it's like, it's diverse and how many things it tries to do and everything like that. So how did Binks the cat, Zachary Bink or Thackeray Bink? Sorry, his name's Thackeray. Dude. It's crazy. Thackeray, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the big name how, in the uh, 69. Yeah, <laughs> huge name, man, Thackeray. Um, how did he learn to speak with a cat's tongue and lips? <laughs> I, I, I don't black but, magic. Yeah, but well, I don't know. Maybe cats could speak if they like, because he knew mean, how he spoke as a human. So maybe they would just be able to if they just knew how to do it, right? <laughs> That's true, but he didn't know how to do it right when he got turned into a cat because his dad shoot him away. Remember, he's like, "Get away, beast!" Yeah, that's right. Uh, yeah. Learned it over time. Actually, if you'd like to find out, um, right now Jason Marsden is starting a pitch to have a Thackeray Banks um, uh, like TV cartoon thing. And if you follow Jason Marsden on Instagram, you can follow along what's going on with that, and it would essentially explain what Banks was up to for the 300-ish years between when he got turned into a cat and when, uh, you know, he's found again in the future by the kids, so. Which is also dark, man. This, how old is he, what, 15, 16, when he gets killed or yeah. turned into a cat? And he's trapped in a cat's body. And he, think about it, dude. He has to watch his family just die and then yeah. this new civilization rise <laughs> up. And meanwhile, he's still, like, on guard and shit. Like, man, that's, that's fucked up, too. No, I know. It's like, it, it's a very, I, I can't wait to see what uh, Jason and the talented people behind that, that whole pitch uh, have to present because, you know, it, it's, it could be really interesting. It could be like a, you know, like a Captain America and Marvel's a man out of time. Well, then you have, not only are you a person out of time, but you also have a cat that has to like kind of grow up and the ever-changing technology because that's one actually one of the interesting things about this movie too that they play with a little bit is the sanderson sisters uh come into like a new time and they try to trick them a few times with modern technology like um uh, headlights and uh sparkling uh a sparkler system and stuff like that so that's yeah, pretty cool how they do that yeah i like to when they, they try to cross the road and like it's a black river or something <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah right uh, but um yeah you know it it's a shame. I, I, it's a shame. Part two sucks. And I know we kind of were easy on it when we reviewed it, but man, that movie has not aged well in my mind at all. Um, but with part three, man, I really hope they bring back this cast that just in some form, they're missing a giant opportunity to not bring back Omri, Vanessa, Thora and all them, man. It just makes perfect sense to have them in this, but I don't know. Yeah. What do you think about we, the boys uh... that, Oh God. I was just going to say, and we interviewed, uh, like, the cast members over the last, like, few, couple of months, which you can find in our, like, back episodes if you want to check them out. And they would, they were all, like, super psyched to come back if they were invited. Uh, Vanessa even said that she would be happy just basically being in the background as, like, a janitor. <laughs> and she, she would, you know, she would totally do it. So there's, like, no reason for them not to bring him back in some capacity, but if they're going to bring him back, I think they should do it right. And I think my pitch would be, you know, if you don't want to lose the Hocus Pocus two people is the Hocus Pocus two people get captured. And the only people who can actually save them is the people who've also defeated the Sanderson sisters, but 30 years ago. So that would, that would bring it all together. They're full circle. Yeah. You finished really the cool. series, right? Because Ben Miller is not going to do a fourth one. I wouldn't think, um, Matt, he's no. probably doing a third one. So I guess money talks. Yeah. So what do you think about the bullies, man? Are they dead? Uh, so, uh, so yeah, are, are they dead? No, I, I don't think they are. Actually, so I, I didn't ask her on the interview because I didn't know if it was like an appropriate question, but I did ask her off the air. So Amber, who made the, um, the Hocus Pocus set, if you own the Hocus Pocus set, which you 100% should, um, the, the like uh, cages in the house have skeletons in them. And uh, that, to me, because the set is approved by Disney, I asked her, so is it canon that they're dead? Because if she put the skeletons in there and it's approved by Disney, that would mean that they were actually in there and deceased. But she told me that Disney actually made her remove any type of reference to say that those were the bullies in there, not just two skeletons. So, Interesting. So canon-wise probably still alive very cool well hopefully we see them too man 
That just I makes agree. perfect sense. They, they were, they, this was our first year beating them. They were so cool. Very nice guys. Uh, uh, I, like me and Tobias, who plays uh, Jay, uh, in the green room, trying to figure out how they have their fucking Salem 16th Chandridge, like, coffee machine that they had in there it was like basically like this weird this weird cauldron thing with, with like grounds that we had to figure out it was so funny um yeah but we'll have all those stories about like behind the scenes stuff uh next week but yeah that was they, they, they were cool man it was it was a great time it's very cool all right so let's rate this fucker yeah absolutely um we so, got uh, so yeah i will admit i don't think it's a perfect movie and I am very stingy when it comes to five out of fives. And I think if I'd grown up with nostalgia for this movie, maybe I would have it there. But as it stands, I give it a 4.5 out of five. I do love the hell out of it. I think it's extremely entertaining. I will wa keep watching it every single October till the day that I die. But I just don't think it's quite the five out of five masterpiece. So 4.5 is where I'm at. All right. I have numerous issues with it that I didn't even touch upon because whatever. But I'm going to keep my score at a 5 out of 5. Is it a perfect film? No. Do I hate the musical number? For the most part, but it still makes sense in the in the film. I love all the characters. I love the pacing of this. The witches, everyone just plays their part perfectly, and I think it meshes together very nicely. Um, yeah, Halloween staple for me since I was a kid. You know, huge crush on Sarah Jessica Parker, uh, Parker and Vanessa Shaw back in the day. Still do. And uh, yeah, just an excellent film all around. Let's see what our friends at Letterboxd say. They agree with us and they're at a... Well, actually, they don't. You give it a four and a half, I get a five. Hocus Pocus gives... I mean, uh, Letterboxd gives it a 3.5 out of five, which is still pretty dang good. Yeah, that's pretty good for a children's movie from the 1990s. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, no, that's, that's awesome. And I mean, everyone, uh, you missed the event. You know, we, we talked about it for the last, God, <laughs> like six months <laughs> promoting it. You missed it. You're probably sad about it. I get it. But you'll be happy to know that we're starting to talk about 2025. So keep those Octobers open because who knows what kind of crazy things are going to happen in Salem, Massachusetts next year. So definitely... Stay tuned for that. And next week, we are going to a complete opposite end of the horror spectrum with Terrifier 3, the movie number one at the box office, which is absolutely insane for this movie that was just a small part of an anthology to a movie that just came, you know, like an indie movie that came out. And then last year with a limited theater release and this year, number one. Cannot wait to talk about Terrifier 3 next week. And like I said before, stay tuned till after the show for the six amazing interviews that we got going. Don't forget to follow us on all social media. You know, we're on X, we're on Instagram. We're on that other one that Instagram pushes all the time, but I always forget the name. Uh, I don't know. Threads, that's right. I was like, I, I've never. It, it like it always says stuff to me. Like your friends want to talk to you, and I click on them. Like what the fuck is this? And I'm like, wait, never mind. I'm not signing up. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but the best way is definitely Discord. Like I said, absolutely free. And we have some amazing people. We got to hang out with them, uh, some of them over the weekend, and we had such a cool time uh, hanging out with them. So thank you, everybody. You all know who you are, and you can also buy some merch, including the Hocus Pocus uh, themed. Horror Squad shirt that you you saw us probably wear on social media or live at the event that's available on T Public. We also just released the design for our movie poster that you could also now wear on merchandise at T Public. I will just advise that we do not get much money when people buy off T Public. It's really just something to support us in a sense that they're representing us out in the world. If you actually want to donate to that, please go to Indiegogo, and that does go to us. And just a little note, do not uh, tip Indiegogo, which is an automatic thing they do, which I really hate. Not one penny of that would go to us. That would just go to Indiegogo. Uh, if the idea is to support us, you know, do so with by buying one of the many perks that are available. And uh, there's other stuff that Joe says every week. I don't remember what it is. He's the, uh, he's the he, pro at this. He, yeah, he, he does a long spiel, but we'll cut it short. Yeah, we'll cut it short. So stay tuned. <laughs> Six interviews. Thank you again that we you know for bearing with us we didn't get the live episode done the way we wanted to but at least we got something out for you guys this week and uh we'll talk to you next week with terrifier three
Bye. Bye. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Horror Squad podcast. Today, we have a very special guest. She is the designer of the Sanderson Sisters Cottage Lego set from Hocus Pocus, Amber Vite. Thank you very Thank much you for, for having me. <laughs> this set is incredible. The amount of detail is really cool. How did you get started with this project? Oh, well, it's been a while. Um, it originally started when I just was looking at the movie and thought, oh my God, I need to design a Lego set. So I started grabbing all my bricks to start making something, but I couldn't figure out which bricks to use where, and I didn't have enough. Uh, so I looked up and there was a program uh, called Studio where there's literally every brick in the world. And so you could be really creative. And that's when I started building something that I just wanted for myself. Uh, but I couldn't order the bricks because the colors didn't exist in the right, in the right way. So I was like, okay, now I have this digitally, but I can't actually have it. Um, and somebody replied on my Instagram post that there is uh, this website, Lego IDs, where you can upload any idea as a fan. Every, anyone can do it. And it's to gain 10,000 of votes um, to be seen by Lego. And then they consider if they want to make it a real set or not. So they see if it's playable. Is it colorful? Do people actually want it? Can we sell it? And then you get feedback, yes or no. And the second time I tried, I got a yes. So that's how it all happened. That's amazing. It came out so well. What made you choose Hocus Pocus as the Lego build you wanted to do? Because it's my favorite movie since as a kid. And it's kind of weird because in Belgium, people don't celebrate Halloween. Uh, so I'm kind of the, the weird one in the street. Uh, but it used to be a habit watching it with my sister every year on Halloween. And I still do it every year. So that's why. Awesome. Um so was last year your first year in Salem, or had you come here before? No, Salem it was my before. first year in Salem, uh, and I really loved it, and so that's why I had to come back. <laughs> Hopefully, there's a next year. So yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, you're, you're coming a long way uh, yes. to, to do these events. It's uh, worth how it. did you first uh, get into contact with the cast of Hocus Pocus? How did that all come about? Well, I think it was Vanessa who reached out to me through Instagram. And she was like, hey, we're doing this event. You want to come? I was like, okay, yes, of course I do. Um, and that's how we got in touch. And I got to meet them. And yeah, it was a dream to ever meet them. So it's really cool. What are your thoughts so far on the It's Just a Bunch of Halloween event this year? It's awesome. It's awesome. It should happen every year. So everybody has the opportunity to meet them, to see everything, to see Salem, to get to see the filming locations it's worth to come here. So I hope it keeps continuing. Uh, speaking of the filming locations, a lot of the Salem locations look the same as they did over 30 years ago. Do you have a favorite location? Yeah, obviously the Denison house. I, I really like the Denison house. Uh, it's also beautiful at sunset. I've been there last year when the sun went, uh, because, uh, how do you say it? Over the ocean. Over the it was ocean, very yeah. beautiful. Yeah, yeah, it's my favorite one. Excellent. Are there any other Lego projects that you've worked on or want to work on? Work I've on? worked on uh, the Pippi Longstocking one, but it's not really working out the way I hoped. Maybe it's not famous enough. I don't know. Um, but now I'm trying on something new. I'm not going to say it yet before, before it's out there. Um, but I'm working on new stuff, yes, because it's very addictive to do. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. And if people want to find you on social media, where can they find you? Yeah. Um, my social media Lego name is um, the Embernator, so that's how you can find me. Rush. Thank you very much, Amber, for coming on the show. I absolutely love your Lego set, and I look forward to seeing you again next year. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Horror Squad podcast. Today, we have a very special guest. She is the author of the new book, Witches Run Amok, Hocus Pocus, The Oral History, Shannon Carlin. Thank you very much for coming on. Thank you so much for having me. We're here at the It's Just a Bunch of Halloween event. So let me ask you, what started your love for Hocus Pocus? Funny because I think a lot of people have asked me when was the first time you saw the movie? And I, I can't remember. It's the kind of movie that's just been in my life my whole entire life. You know, I'm of the age where it came out in theaters when I was a kid and I watched it. You know, I got it from Blockbuster and watched it. So I feel like it was very early that I fell in love with it. I remember my mom saying we had to buy it because I was going to rent it <laughs> too many times. So we had to buy a copy. And I feel like that spine of that VHS is like emblazoned in my mind. It's it's so iconic. Um, so I think it was just an early, I think like most people, it, I, 
I watched it when I was a kid and it it's it just I fell in love with it. So where did you get the idea for this book and when did you start the process? So, you know, it started with a story I'd written. My background is in journalism. I had written a story for a website called Bustle. It was about it was a oral history about the I put a spell on I put a spell on you scene specifically, a lot of words there. Um, and it was, I, I had spoken to Thora, I had spoken to David Kirshner, I had spoken to Doug Jones. I had, I had gotten a few of the the heavies, I guess. And an agent reached out um, a few years later and was like, would you like to expand this into a book? I had never thought about writing a book. I had never thought about writing a book about Hocus Pocus. But then immediately when they gave me that opportunity to think about it, I was like, there are so many stories here. It is something that hasn't been covered in very deeply, as deep as we think, there's a lot of lists about the book and a lot of fun facts, but there's not a lot of deep dive into into the movie and sort of the real craft of it. I think a lot of it is very fun stories, but there's not as much about the actual behind the scenes and and again the craft that went into it from the cast and the crew. Um, and so you know that just sort of led me on the path of of trying to get stories that no one had heard. And you know this process, I think it took me about a year, and probably I started about two years ago, three years ago, when I was reached out to do the book. And it maybe took me about a year to gather all of the interviews. It's an oral history. So it's very much um, in in the voices of the people I spoke to. And I spoke to about over 100 people, um, you know, people who were in the cast and the crew and, you know, fans of the of the movie, Salem locals, drag performers who perform as Winnie. Uh, I tried to get a really put out a wide net to get as many people as I could to talk about this movie. That, that's amazing. Um, we're here with five members of the cast today. How open were they with information regarding their experiences making this movie? Very open. And I think, you know, for anyone who has gone to an event like this that we're at today, um, they are so generous with their time and were so generous to me. There were multiple interviews, hours of time that I spent asking them questions, personal questions, personal questions about a time in their life that maybe wasn't the easiest. You know, this movie didn't do as well as anyone hoped it would when it first came out. So I'm asking them to go back to maybe some times that were a little more difficult. And when they were children and young adults, perhaps they don't remember all of this. They're sort of digging into their memory bank to sort of answer my questions and yet they gave me so much time a stranger you know I think that's something we should really think about these are I am not someone they knew I'm not friends with these people I didn't have any prior you know relationships with anyone um, these were me just cold emailing them to ask them some personal questions and they were all so kind and I think you know if you read the book you can get some real emotional you know elements I think because this movie has done so well now it's become such a phenomenon that they all have a different insight into what it was like then. And it's easier to speak about. So I think that was also helpful that there, this is, this could have been a tragedy in which this movie failed and it's, it's, you know, a Phoenix rising. And so, and it just keeps getting bigger. So I think it was much easier for them to speak about it. And I think they were willing to, to dive into maybe some of the more negative parts of, of the release of this movie. Hocus Pocus popularity has grown so much over the last few years. And in particular, Salem has really embraced the film. What are your thoughts about Salem and how they embrace this movie? You know, it was really fun talking to locals of Salem for the book, because I think that's such an important part of this. While it wasn't, I think we all think, a lot of people think this movie was fully filmed in Salem and it's really such a small portion, but it's such, it's cast such a long shadow. It's such a, such an important part of it. And I, I think the the city of Salem has taken that as well. They've they've taken on sort of the responsibility of being the place where Hocus Pocus is made for, for better and worse, perhaps. And I think that was really interesting to speak to people who are from Salem, who were like, you know, had had maybe mixed feelings about the about the popularity of this movie and, and what it's sort of done to the city during Halloween and, and all year when people come to visit the the locations while they love it and they get a lot of business you know i think they hope that people can be respectful of their city um so i think it's such a big part salem is such a big part of this story and and i hope that you know from my perspective that in the book we we get at that we get at the idea that salem is such an important part of this movie and really we should um they've embraced it in a way that's helped this movie's you know legacy one cool thing regarding the filming locations in Salem is that they pretty much haven't changed since they filmed the movie over 30 years ago. What's your favorite Salem location to visit? 
I think it's the town hall. I think there's something about the outside of that building that's really, it's such a beautiful building without knowing that it was the ho uh, Hocus Pocus location, right. technically outside, the outside of it, the facade used. Um, so I have to say that one. I mean, there's not a bad one. So I, I don't want anyone to come for me and tell me that I'm wrong, but that's my favorite personally. And I, I always love going there. And I definitely plan to go there with the book today or this one of these days and take a picture in front of it because I just love that spot. Everyone needs to check out this book, which is run amok, Hocus Pocus, the oral history. Is writing something you want to continue doing? And is there anything you're working on that you could talk about? You know, I love the experience of writing this book. My background is in journalism, um, pop culture journalism. So, you know, I am used to writing about movies and TV, but this was such a, an amazing experience to really deep dive into something and spend time just thinking about it. The amount of times I watch this movie to write this book is at once crazy, but also amazing. Um, you know, I'm planning to pitch more books like this, more movie, oral histories, movie, you know, be behind the scenes books. I don't have anything I can talk about right now, but, you know, I hope to write more and I hope that people will read this book and know that I I really, you know, tried to put my heart into it. And and I, I love the movie and I wanted it to be a love letter to the fans, but also a love letter to all the people who worked on it, who worked so, so hard. And I hope that people, when they read it, maybe get a, a better sense or, you know, of of the craft that went into this movie. Because I think sometimes we can say, oh, it's a fun little movie. And I think there's just so much in it that is just so well done that I hope that people, when they watch it, start to see just like <laughs> the craft that's in it. Again, not to reuse that word, but just how well it's made. If people want to follow what you do next, where can they follow you on social media? You yeah. know, I I am one of those people that I do not have my name as my social media handle. So, of course, if I tell you it, it's going to be long, but it is at new underscore girl underscore Friday, um, which uh, ask me what that story is, you know, DM me or whatever. Um, I'll tell you. But if someone would like to know what I'm working on, I do post stuff about, you know, behind the scenes stuff of the movie. Some of the information that's not in the book I have, I've been trying to share. So. Uh, yeah, you you might find some new facts that aren't even in the book, sort of behind the scenes of the book from me. Well, Shannon, thank you very much for taking the time to do this interview. Everyone, please go check out this book, which is Run Amok, Hocus Pocus, The Oral History, which is out pretty much everywhere. I've seen it in yeah, most stores. Yeah, your favorite bookseller, <laughs> wherever <laughs> you can get it. And I hope you do. Awesome. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Horror Squad podcast. We are here back at It's Just a Bunch of Halloween Weekend, and we are going to be conducting some interviews while we are here. I am here with Lohan's Playhouse. <laughs> hey, guys, I'm Mike. Mike. Mike from Lohan's Playhouse. Why Lohan's? So the story behind Lohan's Playhouse is uh, my stepson, um, okay. recently, uh, over the past few years, he unfortunately passed away. He's no longer with us. But um, he was a big Dungeons and Dragons fan. So um, when I got my, when I was doing my horror sleeve, I've always wanted a horror sleeve. And um, I didn't know how I was going to kind of come up with the concept of how my, I, did, I didn't just want a bunch of like faces on my arm. So he, his character, his Dungeons and Dragons character was named Lohan. And he was like, he wore the trench coat. He had, um, he had elf. He was an elf. Um, and he had this uh, owl that he kept with him. That was like his little sidekick. And when I designed my tech, my sleeve, that was the center point. It was Lohan going up against all my favorite horror characters. That's great. So then when I came up with Lohan's Playhouse, as I started getting into the, the masks, um, I wanted to brand it in some way and no, there was, in my opinion, no better way to do it than to honor my stepson, you know? So, uh, you see on the little logo there, you see the little guy with the trench coat, I that's do. Lohan and Lohan's Playhouse. That's great. Wow. That, that, that's awesome. And for those of you obviously who aren't here, his sleeve is amazing. It's just all our characters and whatnot. And Lohan's Playhouse. I honestly, it was. I was looking around at all the vendors. Yours obviously caught oh, my you. eye. Thank you. Know, you. I appreciate being it. Us, <laughs> us being the big horror fans we are. I'm like, look at those Myers masks over there. You know, they stuck right um, out. Um, you know, so I mean, have you been a horror fan your whole life? What made you want to get into? Mask so yes, making? to answer your first question, I've been a horror fan since I was like five years old. I remember the first horror film I saw was with my dad, Poltergeist, first one, and that would that introduced me into it, and then. 
I kind of ventured on into my own. Uh, I remember Child's Play was one of the big ones that kind of got me into the slasher genre. Sure. Um, and then from there, it was just, it became a lot of lifeline session. You know, and I'm sure you, I know you can relate to that. And all of you guys can relate to that. Yes, definitely. Um, yeah. And then with the masks, I remember getting a Myers mask when I was like 12. You know, but back then you had like those, they were, yeah, man, they weren't not, great. Not, yeah, you know, not great they, options. You got the old yeah. Donko stuff. And then um, you had that other, I forget the other company that did it, um, but they they just weren't, you had Cinema Secrets. When I remember when Resurrection came out, that was like the first mask that they were able to get the molds from the movie. And they were yeah. great. They, they were awesome. But that was like, they were like a hundred bucks. And, you know, that's a 12 year old kid. You ain't, you're not getting that. So uh anyways fast forward to now um i feel like everyone has a creative outlet you guys i mean i love that you guys have found this you got the podcast yeah. you, get, you guys are doing this awesome film mm-hmm. um so everyone has a creative outlet and i found mine with doing masks and uh yeah yeah man i do the jason so i i take i just take blanks and i i'll do i'm, st- I'm dabbling into the molds now too okay um, nice. and i just want to give people affordable options you know horror fans that just want an affordable option to to represent yeah. and go out and have fun yeah so. hell yeah that i mean that's like when we went over there i was like oh man these masks are gonna be like so much money and then when i found out the pricing i'm like amazing so yeah absolutely that's and that's awesome that yeah, you're doing it. i mean you're obviously doing it for the horror fans by the horror fans for the horror fans um do you have like um i saw all your jason masks over there you have pretty much every, every single every iteration uh, movie represented <laughs> over there yeah um what what's your do you have a favorite one you uh like making the most so i just recently i, I go through phases right so like just recently yeah. i did the um the fan film the never hike alone oh, nice. so i did the ghost oh, jason nice. one yeah, yeah. and that one was oh, a lot nice. of fun to make um, just because those guys independent, like, you know, I support independent artists Yeah, and they, they had, they just, the success that that film had and the, the way that they just, you know, they were just a bunch of horror fans like us. It's like, you know, let's just make yeah. a fan film. And we, I mean, we've gone what 15 years without a Friday film. So it was a breath of fresh yeah, air crazy. to get like a cool Jason again. <laughs> um so that was a that was a big one and i love doing um final chapter you got the axe wound you got all that damage so that's a lot of fun to do yep um but they're all fun they all have their own unique styles but i also like to make like you know because there are some people who just want like a standard jason mask you just throw the chevrons on sure. give it some weathering have something fun to wear out but then you got hardcore fans like yourself they're like i know which each yeah. one of these is from <laughs> right yeah, yeah so but i remember yeah, being a kid sure. and just being like all that stuff was so out of my price range. Even the NECA ones, when those came out, like even those were like yeah. a little out of the price range. As You know, as a 15, 16 year old kid, they're yep. like, oh, well, you know, I'll just settle with what they got at Party City or back then it was, I forget what it was, uh, I Party. Remember that? Yeah. So you just kind of settle yeah, oh, yeah. for that stuff. So that's my motivation now. Give give affordable options to, to all the horror fans out there, you know? I mean, that's awesome. And obviously we as Harfits appreciate it because these days not much is not much is cheap out there in yeah, the, in the man, absolutely. industry. Are you a collector yourself? So, like I have yeah, I nice. have some stuff. Like I got this really cool uh I don't have a photo of it, but uh Freddy versus Jason. I'm a sucker for that movie. I love it so much. Yeah. And yeah. I have a uh a fan made uh, Jason mask from the, like one of the final scenes when we got the claw marks through it. So I got that up on my shelf. I got a, um, as far as masks go, I have a 78 Myers that I really love. Um, but I also like doing my own stuff. So like I do have my own collection of things, but I have more of a passion of doing my own. So, but um, I got some cool stuff. Uh, I got a, I was just telling a couple of people about a book that I have. I was very fortunate to get. John Carpenter did a collaboration with this. Uh, pardon me, I might butcher this name. I think they're called Dark Knight Comics, and they sold two hundred. They were selling two hundred and fifty of these like exclusive art books that were made by a bunch of uh, international artists were submitting art pieces of art, and um, from the original seventy eight film, and it's like three hundred pages. And each one signed by Carpenter, and I was able to find it. I was able to actually get one of those, so that's like a prize possession yeah. of mine. Um, nice. Yeah, I got some cool stuff. How about you, man? What do you got? What do you got going on? I got every man. <laughs> I'll show you a picture when we're when we're done. Give me a prize possession. I got, what do you got? 
prize possession. I was actually just talking about uh, someone with it earlier. Uh, I like stalked uh, Jamie Lee Curtis. Uh, she was doing an event out, out in uh, Lowell, Massachusetts. And uh, my buddy called me. He's like, hey, she's doing an event. He's like, I know where the celebrities come out in the back. Um, so like I waited out there and there was like maybe 10 other fan, like Halloween that fans that were tipped off about it. So I was able to get her on a, a Halloween piece. That's awesome. Um, which is pretty awesome. So that's definitely one of my, my grail pieces. Dude, that's a, that I was just about sure. to say, you literally yeah. just took the word out of my mouth. That's a grail. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah, absolutely. That's awesome. It's, that, it's definitely a badass. But um, yeah, man, I, I think that's pretty much all I got for you. Um, Everyone though. Please, uh, where can people check you out? Low Hands Playoffs, obviously. Do you have a website? Do Instagram. Where can I got a TikTok. Um, TikTok that doesn't have much right now. I'm working on it. I'm new to the TikTok game. Um, and Etsy, for sure. Yep. Yeah. Etsy. All right. Awesome. Yeah. I mean, like I said, everyone, I mean, his masks very affordable. What, $40, yeah, $40 for, the, for the, Friday, Jasons. the Friday 13th and mask. Then, um, the Myers are a little bit more intricate. There's a little bit yeah. more work goes into those. Of course. So those yeah. are 100 for the Myers. Yeah. Uh, very affordable. Very fair. Once again, everyone, please go check out Low Hands Playoffs. Thank you so much for joining us. Oh, thank us you today. guys for having me. This was incredible. Awesome. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Horror Squad podcast. We are back here at, of course, it's just a bunch of Halloween weekend here in Salem, Massachusetts. Cast is still signing, and I am here now with the lead singer of the band that absolutely brought the house down last night at, at the uh, Sam, uh, the Samhain celebration. Zach, the lead singer of Fable Cry. Zach, how are you doing? Doing fantastic, Joe. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. So uh, why don't you tell our listeners a little bit about Fable Cry, how you guys yeah, started? Yeah, Fable Cry, I, I started when I was 19, and it's been through a lot of different iterations. Um, mm-hmm. We're a, we're five-piece rock bands, uh, theatrical, spooky. Uh, we dress up, we put everything we can into every show, and uh, hope the hope the audience does the same. And they yeah. did last night, man. This It was perfect. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Um, now, you guys are from Na- Nashville. Nashville. Nashville, have you always yes. been a Nashville based yeah. band? Yeah. How's the music scene in uh, Nashville? Like, with because obviously Nashville you always go sort of the country base, obviously seems to be, but like, how's the spooky sort of aesthetic been working? Um, out we've there kind of carved a niche for the spooky. Okay. Um, yeah. yeah, there are a couple of kind of sister bands that we have that we play with. A um, lot of good rock bands um, and, and great venues and everything. I mean, it's an amazing place to form a band because everybody plays exceptionally well. Um, so it hasn't been difficult finding people to play with me and, uh, yeah. who can shred and, uh, you know, for sure. And I mean, like, I, I mean, you got, you guys sounded amazing you. last Thank night you. live. Um, do you guys like, like tour around the country or you just stay We're Nashville, mostly maybe? regional. Yeah. We've done some okay. touring. Um, not since the pandemic have we, have we really gotten okay. much out on the road? Um, yep. We host an annual Halloween show called Festival of Ghouls. We're at the tenth year this year. Oh, that's cool. Um, we do different themes um, at a, a theater space in Nashville called Oz, Oz Arts. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so we focus a lot on that and and recording and uh, and local shows. Uh, yeah, we'd like to get back on the road though more. And Salem, this was nice. this is perfect. I mean, we. I, I was gonna say, I, I think this is probably the perfect like place for you guys with that aesthetic and everything like that. It's it, our first, it first time. time in Salem. Yeah. I as, as a band, how, how, it how has people it. like we've we haven't yeah. been here before, and it's. I mean, yeah, we love Halloween, and obviously, yeah. Um, <laughs> so yeah, it's it's we feel very at home, um, and yeah, we got to make it back up here for sure. Oh, definitely. Um, I mean, I hopefully you guys will be back next year. I think you know this should be a yearly tell, event. Tell all your friends. See- yeah, I will. Tell, we'll tell them, all- hey, yeah. Hey, remember that band? <laughs> yeah, we want them back. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah, we would love to. And yeah, yeah. I I mean, I, you obviously seem to have a great relationship with uh Jason. Yeah. Uh, how, how yeah. Did you guys so um, out? we met on a one of the time film competitions. It was forty eight hour film competition in Nashville. Nice. Some friends were doing. Uh, someone on set knew him. He had just moved to Nashville that year, um, and was trying to get out and meet people. And we met on set, and uh, I, we were like midway through it. I was like, I know this guy. He sounds so familiar. I think I know his voice. And then it it clicked. And uh, I mean, he's just he's so warm and kind. And uh, it was yeah, it was like a hundred degrees that day, and he was taking care of everybody on set. You know, he was like one of the lead actors on on the. We were doing a western, and it was like, but it's still he's you know he's making time to like go grab waters and like snacks for people. Yeah. He's the best. Oh, definitely. 
Now, um, I mean, have you have you always sort of been into the the spooky like you know? Did you grow like was it a like sort of almost at birth type thing? Sort of, you know. Uh, I feel it might have been a little bit of repression. Um, because growing <laughs> up, uh, I didn't. We weren't really allowed to celebrate Halloween much growing up. So, uh, okay. <laughs> then once I kind of got out, I always loved it. Like all my friends, I would see them participating and I'd see them dressing up and like trick or treating. And it was like, well, it was, it was a little evil um, <laughs> for my parents' taste. But little did they know this this would be the rebellion. And now I'm, yeah, it's it's been it's been a long time. I love it. Uh, I've always loved fantasy and, and nice. dark fantasy and and humor and that's you know halloween kind of mixing all of that together is so fun and that's what we try to do with our music too it's it's a little bit of tongue in cheek we we take the music seriously but not ourselves you know sure. yeah. Yeah. that's great um now i i'm, I'm sure you're gonna say uh hocus pocus for favorite halloween movie so give me your second ooh. favorite halloween movie. ooh um <laughs> probably halloween yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Classic. <laughs> you can't, you really cannot go around with it. Now, you know, Halloween, I feel like in horror do go hand in hand. Mm-hmm. Do you think, think they do? Like, so are you a horror fan? I am a horror well? fan. Yeah. Yeah. Big for sure. Nice. Yeah. This is, yeah. uh, I mean, we, we play it up more in, in October, but we're a year round band. So, you know, sure. it's, it's, uh, nice. but yeah, vampires and ghouls and ghosts and demons and possession and all the stuff, all that fun stuff. Um, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Big fan. Um, Hellraiser, some of my faves. Uh, Evil Dead. Nice. Yeah. Amazing. Now, um, many of our listeners may have never heard of Fable Crab before. So, like, how would, you know, just in basically sort of a box, like, how would you sort of describe the band if you were trying to, like, sort of, you know, pitch it to the to listeners that might want to check you guys yeah, out? Yeah. Um, well, what are you waiting for? Just... <laughs> Just listen to it. Um, yeah, it's, I mean, it's rock music. We have a lot of inspiration. So it's, and c- coming from the driver's seat, I'm always admittedly very terrible with this question because I'm like, I mean, I can tell you what I like, but it doesn't necessarily sound like that. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, I mean, uh, Oingo Boingo, Ghost, um, uh, ABBA, you know, um, with there's some metal in there. Uh, it's a it's a spooky rock band. It's a spooky, spooky rock, rock band. band. I, I mean, I think that will pull a lot of our <laughs> listeners in for sure. Right? Yeah, Just our, our last that, album that was a, uh, a concept album about uh, vampires in the 1930s. Um, there was a whole concept oh, of, of blood bootlegging. Um, so if that kind of thing entices you uh, and we have a little like radio dramas style in between the songs, little skits that tie the whole thing together. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Very cool. Um, I, I mean, it was a pleasure. Um, where can uh, everyone find you? Like, yeah, mm-hmm. I, obviously, I know you guys are on YouTube because I saw your YouTube, but you know, yeah, album yeah, available um, online fablecry.com, uh, fablecry bandcamp, uh, Spotify, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, uh, fablecry. You could find us any of those places. Absolutely. All right, everyone, go check out fablecry. Like I said, they absolutely. Brought down the house last night. They killed it. Spooky rock band. What more can I say? See Thanks you guys. so much, Joe. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Horror Squad podcast. We are here once again at It's Just a Bunch of Halloween weekend. And I am here now with one of our good buddies here, Alex, a.k.a. Brokar fan. Now, I guess Alex, before I even met Alex... I knew about Bro Car Fan. You know, he was honestly one of the originators, like the auger. Oh man, uh, I don't Brokar know about originator, thing. but it does <laughs> go back to I when mean, Brokar, they still called the blog. It does. So. <laughs> for, for real, it, it was. Re- so, what made you like want to um, get I've into that? I've been writing about horror movies since I was like a teenager in various like message boards and then websites that no one had ever heard of. Um, and then. This guy who I was writing for on another site that like closed. We started a site called Horror 101 that eventually collapsed. Then I started contributing to other sites. You know, a lot of the big sites, um, you know, Dread Central, Bloody Disgusting, Arrow in the Head, um, which was cool. But I just wanted something like I was tired of like the grind of doing the news coverage 
it was just like, you know, go to the other horror sites and like the trade sites and copy the news, but put it in your own words. Um, so I want to start something a little different that was my own that I control over. Uh, and I'm a big horror collector. So I was like, I wanted to find my niche, something that's yeah. not everyone else was doing. And I mean, other than, you know, home video releases, the, the horror sites predominantly don't really cover that kind of stuff. Um, so yeah, I started Broke Horror Fan because I am a Broke Horror Fan uh, still. And uh, yeah, it's just kind of blossomed from there. Yeah, I, I mean, I remember from so long ago. Like, how old were you when you started? It? Um, It started as a Twitter page. And then came the blog component in, I don't know, like 10 years now? Something. Okay. I don't know. I'm very bad with timeline. There's a date somewhere. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I want to say 2006, so that's not 10 years yet, but... I mean, 2016? No. No, that's when we started the VHS. I don't fucking know, man. Can I swear on here? I'm sorry. Yeah. sorry. <laughs> yeah, okay, yeah. Cut we edit. We edit. So <laughs> it's a bit fine. Just, just go with it. Yeah. <laughs> Fuck you, Steve, Steve does the editing. Um, now, so, I mean, recently, you guys have gotten into... I mean, I say you guys, because you... Witter with, Entertainment. Is it Whittier yes. Entertainment to do Witter, Witter Entertainment for yes. um vhs yes you we're guys now are going on VHSs. our sixth year of doing vhs tapes um again very much like the site uh i wanted to find something that other people weren't doing uh witter is james who's one of my best friends in the world uh we've collaborated on other stuff uh he's he's a very talented musician which is how we originally connected bonded over our love of pop punk um and then he was like you have a pretty big audience and you know websites don't make money anymore from ad revenue unless you're a giant website he's like you should find a way to like he, we, he like joked just calling it exploit my audience but like he was like you know we should do some kind of thing and if you want need help with it let's do it so we were kicking around ideas and like there's so many all the stuff that i collect it's you know t-shirts vinyl posters uh there's already so many amazing companies that do that you know top of the line that we could just not compete with um but the idea came about of VHS, which is something I considered in the past. And at that point, Victor Crowley, the fourth Hatchet movie had just come out. And I'm a big fan of Adam Green stuff. And I just sponsored his podcast's charity uh, recording. And so I had a contact there and I was like, hey, what are the odds? I know Adam doesn't have the rights, but could he put us in touch with who does at Dark Sky? Um, so that happened. We made that work. Uh, it was our first release. It's, um, you know, officially licensed, fully functional VHS tape. The movie's cropped to four by three. Uh, sometimes we have exclusive artwork or extras. And yeah, now we've done, I mean, literally some of my favorite movies from the last decade I've got to put on on VHS. We've done, you know, the Terrifier movies, uh, Host, Mandy, Color Out of Space, uh, Willy's Wonderland, Yoga Hosers, just to name a few. Yeah, I mean, it, it's real. That's really, really awesome. And obviously, the Terrifier ones are amazing. And you fucking guys got into Walmart. I mean, that's a big deal. Yeah, you talk uh, about that a little things, bit. Like, <laughs> the the possibility came up. Um, I also work for Bloody Disgusting. I I write for them and work for Screenbox, their streaming service. And the idea came about Bloody Disgusting was going to have this. Uh, activation in walmart's that would be branded and they were looking for merchandise to put in there and i'd worked with them on some of the screen box sizes. we had put terrifier 2 out on vhs already on our own and they were like you know we think this would sell and it was actually a tough sell to walmart because well first of all they didn't think anyone would buy vhs in 2024 which is fair and they also the the area this end cap that they have was not supposed to have media in it because they didn't want it competing with you know their their blu-ray sales um but we were able to convince i mean i say we we it was like a very long chain of command but ultimately they were convinced that it's a collectible more than a piece of media which is true uh i mean we saw a lot of tapes and i would say maybe 50 percent of them are actually watched the other 50 percent are you know collectors because they do look awesome on a shelf um and that was always our thing we, it's a functioning collectible we call it um yeah so one thing led to another and then it was just like we were talking about it for months and months and months about the possibility and like just when we thought it was never going to happen they're like oh yeah we need six thousand tapes in whatever it was two months and uh yeah then it was in walmart and it was super hard to find it was like the first thing that sold out in all it of was. their i think yeah we were in something like 
I don't know, 2000 stores and each store got like three copies. Um, so it was very hard to get uh, for the people who wanted it. It, it sold out pretty fast. Um, and yeah, now we're hoping we get another thing in Walmart soon. But even if we don't, just the fact that there was a wide release VHS tape, I mean, fluke or not, it's I mean, as a collector, not even someone who's involved with making the tape uh, just, I don't know, blows my mind. Yeah, I, I mean, how is that? That must have been a grind. Like <laughs> uh, six thousand. I won't lie. We VHSs. um, it was, <laughs> but we we outsourced the duplication on this one. Everything else we've done prior and since for our in-house releases, which you can find at WitterEntertainment.com, I should say, um, those are all literally just James and I. I crop them and do the graphic design for the artwork. He duplicates and assembles and ships them. Um just the two of us but for because this was such a huge order and with a fast turnaround we did outsource a duplicator excellent uh, um so i guess my final question for you is what's next for bro car fan for bloody disgusting for screen box what, what do you got going Man. on where can people find um, it's everything? october so there's a million things going on um you can find bro car fan on all the social medias at bro car fan uh i'm trying to become a tiktok sensation uh, so please follow me on TikTok. I have like 30 followers. Uh, no, but I am trying more video stuff, which is, uh, I don't know, interesting, kind of a change of pace for me. Uh, but yeah, we're always putting out tapes. Uh, we're about to announce a pretty big title. Um, we just recently did All Hallows Eve, the, the kind of the, the precursor to Terrifier. Um, and we have some cool stuff already lined up for 2025. Uh, but discussing always a machine, always going with, uh, you know, your latest horror news, editorials, etc. Um, I cover a lot of social media. I mean, a lot of physical media there. Um, Screenbox, we've got some cool stuff coming out. Uh, our next big thing is the Street Trash remake uh, from the director of Fried Barry. I think people are really going to dig that. And uh, eventually, you'll be able to see Terrifier 3 on there, too. Awesome. Alex, one of, honestly, the nice guys Stop. you'll ever meet. So go show him. Go show him some support. Bro car fan, give him a follow. Let's get pump up those TikTok <laughs> numbers. Witter Entertainment as well. Awesome VHSs. You don't want to miss it, guys. Alex, once again, thanks so much. Thank for you, dude. I appreciate joining it. me. All right. Hello, everyone. And we are back here at it's just a bunch of Halloween weekend. We are nearing the end of um the signing event, but we couldn't let this event end with the most important person of the day, the one, the only, the most famous witch in all of Salem, Massachusetts, Bora Brewington Snaggletooth so the 13th. So did you fall and knock your head up to the wall or something? Because hey, all that's a doggone lie. Because that's not true. A lie. I have to talk to Sam about you. She's probably going to hit you upside the head for lying, too. How are you, Joe? I am wonderful. How is how's the cauldron? How is everything going house, at the house? It's a coven. I'm sorry. Wake up a, and a smell okay. the, co the <laughs> coffee, boy. <laughs> but the cauldron is fine. I got it on the on the fire and i got some kids in there and i got it boiling up we're gonna have dinner tonight and uh you want to come and eat i would love to what's kids, on the menu kids kids, more kids. How, how many how many children does it like does it take to put in the cauldron for like the, the perfect, perfect so it depends on how much they weigh and it depends on how much okay. they pee pee because if they pee pee <laughs> then they're less weight so that's good. Then they're dehydrated. But that's okay if they pee and they're dehydrated because the boiling water will, will rehydrate them. But anyway, about three. Yeah, if you and about Sam three? and Joe and Count Dracula and, uh, you know, the cast of Hocus Pocus, because that's what we're here Ooh, for. Yep. If they come that's right. They have three kids. Three, three, three for the per. Okay, it feeds about seven, eight. Eight. Three kids. Eight. eight. Okay. Yes. Eight. All right, eight, eight Get kids. Eight. Perfect. You ate the kids. Perfect. All right, age. <laughs> now I just, I just heard you mention Count yes. Dracula. Um, you know, are you guys yeah, friendly? Very friendly. And more than one. How friendly are we talk? Like. You know, who is Boris seeing Well, these Count days? Dracula, is there, is there but out I think there? I gotta get rid of him because when we go on a date, he sucks the hell out of my wallet. 
he he leaves me dry. Talk about dehydrated. dehydrated. Mm. Yeah, but you know what? Right. It's okay. All he needs is a glass of red wine, and he's happy. Mm. Now I I gotta ask. Um, you know, I see the broom. You got a, you got a beautiful broom here. Um, you know what? You know what? What is the speed of the broom you got there? And you know, are there different iterations? Like if you did use like a home, like a you know a, a current broom, is that different than you mean more a of current a current broom from like uh, Publix or Kroger? Yes, those yeah. don't work. They don't work no, at all. No, just the mortals okay. use those. They think the they're funny okay. and cute. Yeah, and they put on right. that little Walmart of spirit sure. Halloween costume, <laughs> and then they go to Walmart or they go to. Kroger, and then get one of those cheap brooms. No, no, no. You got to go into the woods late at night during a full moon and cut down a branch. Yes. Actually, a dead branch branch is better when it's laying on the floor. Okay. And then you just take a little bit of pine straw and you make the bristles. Yeah. Okay. But you know what? There are. It all depends on how fast the wind is blowing. Yes, Ooh, the faster okay. the wind, the Love farther that. you go. It's like an airplane. You got to watch out for the sense. trees because it hurts when you hit them. But you know what? Mm. I have a broom for you. Yeah, I have to Ooh. drop it off over after this weekend. Yeah. Ooh, okay. Sam's going to be that. jealous. Thank you so much, Bor. I'm sure she's she got one She will be jealous. Walmart. She'll be, she'll be very jealous of me. Knowing her. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Good too. Yeah. Now, how did Bora come about to Salem? Have you always lived in Salem? You're th- how many? Three hundred twenty-nine years old. Three hundred twenty-nine. Oh, so have you been yes, here? Yes, I've been here three hundred twenty-nine years. years. But a very long story short, I had friends and family that were, you know, they were accused of being witches. Yeah, because they played with herbs and they played with, you know, little frogs and all. They were trying to be themselves and then they got blamed for witchcraft and, you know, and then they were all hanged. And so that's that's how that goes about. And that's just part of my ancestry. But we, you know, we that's that's the deal. Banana peel. All right. That's perfect. I don't want to bore you with the details. No, I I mean, I love the details because boar is the best. This is your busiest time of the year. For, uh, uh, so I guess my final, final question, question is, and I'm having fun. fun. Well, that's a first, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> yeah. Okay. It is a first. I, so I guess my final question is what, um, you know, makes Halloween the most special for Bora. Okay. This time I gotta be year. truthful with you. I love giving away trick or treat candy to all the trick or treaters. And that's very rare for Bora because Bora hates everything. I do hate him. I throw the candy at him and try to hit him upside the face. (laughs) But I have a couple of questions for you before we get off. Okay, okay, I'll take it. Rapid fire. Favorite Halloween candy? uh, Reese's cups. Really? Mine too. Now, how do you eat them? Okay. I didn't. Which is chocolate? chocolate? Okay, I thought it was just children. Chocolate covered children. Chocolate. Chocolate. Okay. Chocolate covered roaches. Double yes. dip for your pleasure. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> okay. What was your favorite Halloween memory as a kid growing up? I think just trick-or-treating with my friends in the neighborhood. Did you ever toilet paper trees in egg houses? No, I was actually a very good kid. I didn't uh you didn't do smash pumpkins? Like no, no. Who else do that? I love Halloween. Well, Why would I, I want to destroy the Just do that. I, yeah, I know they're they, jerks. I, I, they are jerks, but you know what? And I don't like that. I smashed only one pumpkin in my life. Yeah. That okay. was, you know, about several years ago. Okay. What? I got one One more question for you. I see there's a yes. mouse. Is that a mouse on the top? Of uh, What's more the on the mouse? mouse. Yes. More on the yes. mouse. You know, Love this that. hat came from That's Ever perfect. Crumbly and Witch. Okay. Yes, yeah. Great company. Some wonderful hats. Yes. Mm-hmm. And um, that. so that, yeah, you got to get one. That's awesome. Yeah. I will. I'll I want to say you're working Bora. your butt off. You and the volunteers and yeah. um, the horror Thanks. squad podcast. I always mess that up. Did I get it right? <laughs> Thank you. Right? Thanks. Satan. You got it right. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for your work. Awesome. The Bora, worst. you're the best. We love you. Anyone who wants to see Bora, the most famous witch in Salem. The only way to see her is to come out to Salem. I do. But you do, do some I do, events, right? I do, do weddings. I do wedding vow renewals. When? I do baby gender reveals. Yes. And I will fly wherever. 
I, no, you, I you don't have, have cameo? cameo. I don't have time for that. But if Not somebody yet? wants a video, they can just All send right. us an email. It's Salem's black hat that you wear society no no that's my website salem my website is salem's black hat society.org and there you can order a video through email and also follow me on all my social medias at salem's with apostrophe s black the color black hat society on all social medias again it's salem's black hat society amazing and if you want to see Bora in person come out to Salem she is out every pretty much every weekend Friday, in October Saturday, Sunday. you can't miss you you can't miss her she's got the cauldron out there loud she, she'll try keep your children a little give them a little space she might try to eat them put them in the cauldron but other than that go see Bora she'll give you one of the best experiences in all of Salem Bora thank, thank you so you much for, for having me today. Happy Halloween! Trouble. Tell me, friend, what is this contraption? I call it a bus. A bus? A what? <laughs> and its purpose? To convey gorgeous creatures such as yourselves to your most forbidden desires. <laughs> well, then, sir, we desire children. <laughs> hey, that may take me a couple of tries, but I don't think that'd be a problem. Hop on up. Mom! <laughs>